Chapter Three of Bizarre by Lawton McCall. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Nick Olka. Portable pigeonholes. Aside from a few unimportant physical distinctions, the chief difference between man and woman is that his pockets are in his clothes, whereas her solitary one dangles fitfully from her hand. Man is girded about with these little repositories for the safekeeping of his belongings, while woman, less interested in conservation than in cosmetics, holds her booty ever accessible, so as to be able at any moment to dispose of three dollars and ninety-eight cents or powder her nose. The ding of her husband's cash register and the click of her dangle bag mark the systole and diastole of married life. Man delights in multiplicity of pockets. He must have clusters of them, layers of them, pockets within pockets. Otherwise, his search for anything he has hidden on his person would be uninterestingly simple. Fancy, for example, the monotony of traveling. If, at the call, all tickets please, there were but a single pocket to excavate. And how difficult it would be when riding on a streetcar, for one to put up an appearance of searching madly for his purse while he allowed his companion to pay the fare. The instinct for stowing away things in pockets, manifested in childhood by a proneness for smuggling home from parties such contraband as strawberry tarts and layer cake with soft icing, continues throughout life. But as one grows older, the reason for these caches is less and less obvious. The delectable but adhesive loot in the boy's pocket is soon separated, as much as possible, from the lining, and devoured in rapture. But the dry accumulations of the middle-aged man, such as useless ticket stubs, old newspaper clippings, business cards thrust upon him by salesmen or accepted absent-mindedly when handed to him on the street, unposted letters which he promised three days ago to drop into the first mailbox. All these lie buried and forgotten until resurrected on soup-pressing day. He secretes them with the infatuation of a dog in tearing bones. Only, unlike the sagacious hound, Instead of getting rid of them by this process, he merely turns them into encumbrances. A pocket that has long suffered from congestion will sometimes take matters into its own hands and empty itself. Without bothering to give any warning of its intention, it acquires a hole in one corner and then quietly disposes of its contents. In this way, small but useful change departs in company with your latch-key via your trouser-leg, and your unfortunate fountain-pen, let down suddenly as though by a springing of a trap-door, falls clearly to the bottom of the inside of your waistcoat, where it lies prostrate, gasping out its last spurt of ink. There is a treacherous kind of pocket, inhabiting a vertical slit in the side of an overcoat, that simulates openness when it is actually closed, so that the unwary owner, imagining himself to be putting a thing into a safe nook, is really poking it through a hole and dropping it upon the ground. The average tailor has an unpleasant sense of humor. He allows you fifteen pockets, and then proceeds to fit your suit so closely that not a single one of them can be used. Unless you take the precaution of stuffing each pocket with cotton batting when he tries the suit on you, he will systematically take in all seams and buttons 
in such a way that a postcard inserted in the breast pocket would be sufficient wadding to throw the entire coat out of shape. Perhaps he goes on the assumption that when you have paid his bill, you won't have anything left to put there. Every pocket is a latent distortion. Put something into it, and you have a swelling, a tumor. Utilize your hip pocket as an oasis, and you have a bustle. These cares and tribulations are, as we stated at the beginning of this treatise, the lot of man alone. For woman, while accepting the responsibility of the vote, has thus far avoided the responsibility of the pocket, preferring to let her husband be a walking warehouse for two. It is her method of maintaining him in subjection. If she too were be-pocketed, she could not keep him on the jump picking up things she has dropped and trotting back for things she has left behind. Nor, if she were not in the habit of making him dutifully store her gloves, fan, handkerchief, etc., on his person, could she put him in the wrong by taking him to task for forgetting to return them? No, woman is too wise. She talks very blandly about equality, but so far, the only representative of her sex to wear a real pocket is the female kangaroo. End of chapter 3